Harrier. Perhaps the world's smallest and most elusive combat aircraft, the Jump Jet Harrier is unique. If there should ever be a war between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, one can take it for granted that all NATO airfields would be wiped off the map within 24 hours, and probably within 24 minutes. NATO would be left with no land-based air power whatsoever, except for a handful of Harriers, which can be dispersed to hide and fight. Many people, ignoring this rather important fact, have poured scorn on the little airplane. Their numbers sharply diminished after the Falklands campaign, when Harrier and Sea Harriers flew fighter and attack missions in weather that would have grounded every other fast jet in the world. It's now almost 30 years since the Harrier's little Hawker predecessor first got daylight under its wheels. Since then, the Harrier family has come a very long way indeed, and the story is still being written. Some 35 years ago, the press called this strange contraption the Flying Bedstead, and it was generally regarded as a kind of joke. But in fact, the principle of rising vertically from the ground on the thrust of a jet engine meant that eventually high-speed aircraft could be built that could operate without an airfield. In other words, they would survive in a war. By 1955, two short SC-1s were being built in Belfast, each fitted with five RB-108 turbojets. Four were arranged amidships, pointing down to provide lift. The fifth one was in the tail to provide thrust in the normal way. With Chief Test Pilot Tom Brook Smith in the cockpit, the throttles of the four lift jets were opened up. The SC-1 lifted vertically off the ground and could then be controlled in hovering flight by compressed air jets at wingtips, nose and tail. By opening the throttle of the engine in the tail, the SC-1 could be made to accelerate forwards. As speed increased, so did the lift of the wings, until the four lift jets could be shut down. This was called an accelerating transition. At the end of the flight, a decelerating transition had to be made back to engine-supported hovering flight, followed by a vertical landing. It was the age of VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. In California, the USAF and Ryan were experimenting with a much simpler VTOL, the one that demanded great piloting skill. Powered by a British Rolls-Royce engine, the X-13 VertiJet could race down a runway like other jets, or it could stand on its tail for VTOL. With its stubby fuselage tilted up at 90 degrees, it rode on its jet and could move up or down according to the pilot's extremely cautious and accurate juggling with the throttle lever. As in the Bedstead and SC-1, compressed air jets were used to control the way it hovered. Its airfield was a huge flatbed vehicle called the Ground Service Trailer, whose large platform was raised by hydraulic rams into the vertical. The Delta Wing VertiJet would take off from or return to the trailer, just like a moth landing on a wall. Accelerating and decelerating transitions were made to and from wingborne or jetborne flight. Thanks to the nerve and piloting ability of Pete Girard, the test pilot, the VertiJet could put on an impressive show. But unless it could have been linked with computerized blind landing systems, it was impractical for an Air Force. It was, however, the Europeans who pioneered military VTOL because, being nearer to a potential attacker, they saw that jet lift could enable their aircraft to escape from their highly vulnerable airfields. West Germany built the VAC 191B. This had a central lift cruise engine with nozzles that could point to the rear or downwards, plus single lift jets in the front and rear fuselage. These lift jets were derived from those of the SC-1 and were used only during takeoff and landing. A totally different German prototype was the VJ-101. This had six Rolls-Royce turbojets. Two were mounted vertically in the fuselage and
and used only for veto. The other four were in pods, pivoting on the wingtips, so that they could point downwards during veto or to the rear for supersonic flight. Another early jet-lit warplane was built by Dassault in France. Based on the Mirage III supersonic fighter, the Balzac featured an enlarged fuselage accommodating eight RB-108 lift engines. None of these exciting aircraft was to lead to anything. In contrast, the simplest type of jet VTOL aircraft possible, with only a single engine and nothing extra in the cockpit except a control lever and indicator for the pivoting nozzles, has gradually revolutionized tactical air warfare. Not only has it enabled air power to be based virtually anywhere, but it has even enabled a war to be won that could not otherwise have been fought at all. This small research model was one of the many that were tested in wind tunnels, and in this case, on a whirling arm. The problems were enormous, and many had never been met before. When the rear jet nozzles were angled down under the tail, it was expected that the tailplane would be thrust violently down, pitching up the nose uncontrollably. Models eventually showed this fear was groundless. This whirling arm rig was used to investigate the rapid accelerating and decelerating transitions. This Pioneer VTOL was the Hawker P1127. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. For the first time ever, here was an aircraft powered by a single jet engine which could rise off the ground vertically with its fuselage in the normal horizontal attitude and accelerate forwards under perfect control to jet fighter speeds. This prototype was a later P-1127 called a Kestrel, first flown in March 1964. This was three and a half years after the first tentative tethered hover of the first P-1127. With its unusual landing gear retracted, the Kestrel could do most of the things a 1950s jet fighter could do. It could also slow to a standstill, hover in mid-air if necessary, and finally make a feather light vertical landing. A fast pass at the Farnborough Air Show by two Kestrels and a Hunter served to show that the little Kestrel despite all the penalties of being able to hover, could beat the conventional hunter in speed, range, and rate of climb. The key to all this was the amazing Pegasus engine, pioneered by Bristol Sidley, which became part of Rolls-Royce in 1966. For the first time, an otherwise normal turbofan engine had four nozzles. There was one on each side at the front for the air from the fan, and one on each side to the rear, for the hot gases from the jet. The nozzles are not actually part of the engine, but part of the aircraft. This leaves the basic engine extremely compact, though very powerful, generating a thrust of about 21,500 pounds. It is only about eight feet long. The Pegasus engine is installed by lowering it into the fuselage from above. It is then coupled up to the four nozzles. These nozzles are arranged two in front of the aircraft center of gravity and two behind, so that the thrust lifts the aircraft straight up without tipping it up on its nose or down on its tail. To evaluate the performance of the unique Pegasus engine, special ground test beds were built at Bristol. Engine efflux is led away out of the building by twin ducts. The test engine is mounted on a cradle high inside the building. The test bed was designed from the start to simultaneously measure both vertical and horizontal thrust. It was also versatile, able to accommodate future vectored thrust or vertical lift engines. On this alternative outdoor test bed, the engine is started and then the nozzles are rotated not downwards but upwards so that the four jets do not blast straight onto the ground as they would in the aircraft. The pilot or the operator on the test bed has just a single lever to control the nozzles. <laughs> 